It's Eric Strong, and today I'll be discussing the medical history and physical, commonly known as an HNP, in a two video series. The learning objectives of these videos is to understand the purpose, content, and organization of the medical HNP, to compare the oral presentation of the HNP to its written form, and to know some additional tips on what makes an effective oral presentation. In the first video, I'll discuss the conceptual details of the HMP. In the second video, I'll give an example of an HMP oral presentation displayed side by side, real time annotations pointing out the concepts introduced in the first. This video will cover topics relevant to both oral presentations and their written counterparts. That's because there are obvious similarities between them. Specifically, the overall format is identical. That is, each has a chief complaint, a history of present illness, past medical history, etc. Each section is presented in the same order and has roughly the same type of content. However, there are, of course, some important differences. The purpose of the oral presentation is rapid communication and to aid in real-time decision-making. Therefore, it avoids excessive details. The purpose of the written note, however, is to serve as a detailed reference and a legal document, and therefore it should be very comprehensive. Let me review the overall structure of the HMP. First comes the reporting section. This is where the presenter or writer conveys factual information as objectively as possible. It's divided into the history, exam, and diagnostics. With the history, there will obviously be some degree of subjectivity, and as the one obtaining the history, the clinician will need to selectively filter out irrelevant information. The history is further subdivided into the source of information, the chief complaint, the history of predecessor illness, past medical history, meds, allergies, and so on. I'll go through each of these in a few minutes. The exam typically starts with a statement about the patient's general appearance, then the vital signs, and the remainder of the exam is usually organized roughly head to toe, other than the neuro exam, which for some reason is often listed last. The diagnostic subsection includes all labs, as well as the results of any other relevant tests, including x-rays, CT scans, and EKGs. Now, in addition to the reporting section, there is also an interpretation section, which is frequently referred to as the assessment and plan. This typically takes the form of a problem list. Each problem that the patient has on admission, whether it's an acute physiologic derangement, uh, a particular symptom, an unexplained exam finding, or a chronic medical condition, should be listed here. For any new problem, there should be a differential diagnosis with explanation. And each problem should have diagnostic, therapeutic, and educational plans, if relevant. I'll discuss this in more detail later as well. Now, these two sections, the reporting section and the interpretation section, comprise the entirety of many HMPs, but there is something critically important that joins the two together. It's often known as the impression, though I find that term to be too imprecisely used. Instead, I call this brief but essential extra section the linking statement. It links the reporting and interpretation sections together, and a bit more than that, which I'll get to soon. Now let me discuss each one of these headings. The very first thing in the HMP should be a brief statement as to the source of information and the clinician's impression of the source's reliability. Here are some examples. Source is the patient, who appears reliable. Source is the patient's spouse, who appears reliable. Source is the patient who appears unreliable, secondary to apparent alcohol intoxication. Or source is the medical chart, as the patient is unconscious and no family or friends are immediately available to provide information. Next is the chief complaint. This is the patient's primary reason for seeking medical attention. It can either be in the patient's own words, which is now less common, but more traditional, or in your own short summary phrase, which is more common, but sometimes discouraged by instructors. In most cases, I prefer the latter. It should only include abnormal exam and lab findings or a diagnosis if they were previously established before the patient arrived. For example, if a patient came to the ER because his primary care provider called to tell him that his blood count was critically low, anemia could be listed as the chief complaint in that case. Now, if the patient is unable to offer any history at all, the chief complaint is why someone else sought medical attention for him or her. I think it's helpful to provide specific structures for the chief complaint. 
If one uses the patient's own words, that structure would be first age and gender, plus the highly relevant items in the past medical history, plus the patient's own words for why he or she is seeking medical attention. For example, Ms. Chang is a 60-year-old woman with heart failure who is presenting because, quote, I haven't been able to catch my breath all day, close quote. Or Mr. Smith is a 25-year-old man with schizophrenia who states, quote, the CIA is trying to control me with microwaves, close quote. The other option for the chief complaint is the short summary phrase. In this case, it's age and gender, plus highly relevant past history, plus the primary symptom or symptoms, plus the duration of that symptom or symptoms. Mr. Singh is a 76-year-old man with diabetes and hypertension who presents with right arm weakness and difficulty speaking for two hours. Although the chief complaint may seem very straightforward, it's the most commonly flubbed part of the whole presentation. And since it comes right at the beginning, if this happens to you, it's guaranteed to start you off on the wrong foot. So let's take a look at some common mistakes. For our first suboptimal chief complaint, Mr. Williams is a 65-year-old man with diabetes presenting with a heart attack. What's the error here? It includes a presumed diagnosis. Revised, it might read, Mr. Williams is a 65-year-old man with diabetes presenting with chest pain for three hours. This might be a good spot to briefly discuss why one should not mention the presumed diagnosis up front. It's basically to prevent excessive biopsying of the listener or reader. An excellent presentation first provides all of the relevant objective data in order and without interpretation, allowing the listener to reach their own conclusions in their head about the diagnosis before the presenter explains what his or her conclusions are. This allows independent verification of the presenter's clinical reasoning process. Let's take a look at some more examples. Here's a chief complaint of Miss Lee is a 14-year-old girl with no significant medical history, presenting with diarrhea for one week and hypokalemia. The error here should be obvious. It includes a lab result that was presumably not known at the time of the patient's initial arrival. The corrected version omits the hypokalemia. Mr. Oku is a 58-year-old man with gout, left knee arthritis, chronic low back pain, and peptic ulcer disease, presenting with an acute abdomen. What's the error here? There are actually two. First, the original version includes parts of the medical history that are completely irrelevant. Second, it includes an interpretation of the exam rather than the patient's presenting symptom. A far better version would read, Mr. Oku is a 58-year-old man with peptic ulcer disease presenting with severe epigastric pain for 45 minutes. Finally, what about this chief complaint? Cough and fever. This complaint provides absolutely no context for the symptoms. Is this a previously healthy six-month-old infant or a 50-year-old man with AIDS? Instead, one could report this as Ms. Patel is a 90-year-old woman with dementia sent from her nursing home for cough and fever for two hours. Remember, the goal with the chief complaint is to provide the context for the upcoming history without giving away the diagnosis prematurely. In the U.S., at least, there is a common variation to the chief complaint as I've described it. Some providers separate the chief complaint into ID for identification and CC for chief complaint. For example, the ID might read, Mr. Jones is an 84-year-old man with cirrhosis, and the separate chief complaint reads, vomiting blood for two hours. I personally think it sounds better and flows better to put them both together into a single line. Moving on to the history of present illness, abbreviated HPI, the HPI is like telling a story, one in which chronology is extremely important. It should include key events and only relevant information. It often begins with, quote, Mr. or Ms. so-and-so was in his or her usual state of health until. Symptoms should be described in addition to just being listed or mentioned. And at the end of the HPI, one should describe the patient's perception of illness, or PPI, as a common variation, some clinicians list the PPI as a separate section immediately following the HPI. Another occasionally encountered variation on the HPI imagines it quite differently. Instead of a story told in prose, the HPI can be listed as a series of dates and events. I won't read through this, but feel free to pause it here if you'd like to uh, look at it on your own.
I find this format works well for unusually complicated HPIs or HPIs that involve multiple prior hospitalizations or multiple adjustments to outpatient medications, which could be contributing to the current presentation, such as changing doses of diuretics or antihypertensives. Next up is the past medical history or PMH. Unlike the HPI, which is typically done in prose, the PMH should always be done as a list. Provide details of each item in proportion to the relevance to the chief complaint in HPI. If an item in the PMH is completely resolved and is of no relevance at all to the HPI, you should omit it. And state chronic disease markers when relevant in order to give the listener or reader an idea of how well that disease is controlled as an outpatient. For example, the patient's baseline weight in CHF, typical outpatient blood pressures and hypertension, most recent hemoglobin A1c and diabetes, and the baseline range of creatinines in chronic kidney disease. Here's what the PMH might look like in a written note. Although not done universally, I find it's very helpful to separate it out into medical, surgical, women's health, and psychiatric sections. Don't worry if some of those specific acronyms are unfamiliar. This is just an example. A common variation of this format will show the identical information, but instead of listing it all under the umbrella term of, quote, past medical history, each subheading becomes its own heading. Although this may be actually more common, I don't like this variation as much as it implies that functionally there is as much distinction between the past medical history and the past surgical history as there is between either one and the HPI or between either one and the med list. The former format simply feels more logically organized to me. Now we have a series of relatively quick and straightforward sections. First, medications. Group them by common indication. This helps the reader or listener remember them. And it also aids in identifying when there might be a class of medication that seems to be missing given the patient's past medical history. Include over-the-counter meds as well as herbals and natural supplements. Report patient adherence to meds. And always use generic names of medications. This isn't because drug companies are inherently evil per se. Instead, it's because often the, the generic suffix will help to identify the medication class. For example, a med that ends in an olol is highly likely to be a beta blocker, and one that ends in a statin will definitely be an HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor. The other reason to always use generics is that your formal exams and tests almost always use generic names as well. For allergies and adverse drug reactions, realize that most things referred to by patients as allergies aren't true allergies, but nevertheless, they should still be reported here. It's the clinician's job to sort out adverse drug reactions, which are more common, from true type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, which are less common. The social history is next. This is not just limited to bad behaviors. It also includes marital status, residential situation, occupation, diet, sexual history, animal exposures, and travel history, if relevant. For smoking, alcohol, and drugs, Always try to quantify how much, how often, for how long, and when was the last time. Family history. Focus on first and second degree relatives with diseases that are associated with established familial risk. The big five are cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, psychiatric disease, and substance abuse. There are others as well, but those are the big five you should always ask about. You do not need to mention that the patient's second cousin has osteoarthritis. Now for oral presentations, stating that the family history is non-contributory is often appropriate and in fact usually preferred if indeed true. However, for written notes, stating non-contributory is generally not acceptable. The final part of the history is the review of systems. For this, any symptoms relevant to the chief complaint and or HPI should be listed in the HPI and not need be listed again here. For oral presentations, it's usually acceptable to state review of systems negative except as previously discussed in the HPI. However, for written notes, all negative responses should be written out. Now let's move on to the physical exam. The first thing to acknowledge upfront about the exam is that there is no such thing as a complete physical exam. 
or at least if there was one, it would be three days long. So the exam should always be tailored to the chief complaint with consideration of the patient's gender and age along with the past medical history. As I mentioned earlier, always begin reporting the exam with a statement as to the patient's general appearance, followed by the vitals, and use appropriate medical terminology. The most challenging thing about performing and subsequently reporting the physical exam is knowing how to make it focused. Suppose we have a 62-year-old woman with active heroin use presenting with fever and dyspnea for four hours. What might an appropriately focused exam look like for her? Here's a reasonable one. To understand why certain things have been included, consider why an individual item might be included. Some parts of the exam might inform us of the overall severity of illness. This would be the case with the patient's general appearance and her vital signs. Other parts of the exam are directly linked to the chief complaint in HPI. So for an IV drug abuser with fever and dyspnea, this would obviously include the pulmonary and cardiac systems, but it would also include components of the extremity exam that would investigate for signs of endocarditis, which might be the most likely diagnosis. We would also want to look for signs of any complications of that most likely diagnosis, in this case, signs of heart failure, for example. And lastly, we would want to quickly identify any important comorbid conditions. These aren't findings directly related to the HPI, but rather would identify any other occult diseases which this patient might have that would complicate their treatment of the primary problem or which we should just try to identify in order to treat itself. For an IV drug abuser, this might include examination of the abdomen for any evidence of cirrhosis that might uh, have been brought on by chronic hepatitis B or C. And this might even include an examination of the lymph nodes for evidence of HIV or other infections. You'll notice that there are a couple of components here not accounted for. The entire HEENT exam, examination of abdominal tenderness, or listening for bowel sounds. We always seem to include these parts of the exam, but if our goal is to provide an exam focused to the HPI, patient's age and gender, and past history, they really shouldn't be there. However, just to be aware that there are a few components that if excluded, this will likely result in you being chastised by your supervising physicians. Some things just always seem to be put into the focused exam, even if it seems like they don't belong. So things like listening to bowel sounds and looking the oral pharynx are just always done. After the exam comes the labs and diagnostics. In the presentation, highlight only those results which are relevant to the HPI and or assessment and plan. In the written note, however, list all recent results irrespective of immediate relevance. Summarize diagnostic reports instead of either reciting or copying and pasting the actual reports. Finally, only binary tests should be reported as either positive or negative. For example, a urine pregnancy test or a stool guaiac test is positive or negative, but a chest x-ray is not. It's not positive or negative, it's either normal or abnormal. Why is this important? Imagine you're listening to someone else present a patient's HMP and the presenter states that the urinalysis was positive. What exactly would that mean? The most common assumption would be that the urinalysis showed evidence of a urinary tract infection. But what was the specific evidence that led the presenter to that conclusion? Was it white blood cells in the urine, or positive dipstick of leukocyte esterase, or something else? Maybe the presenter uses a different cutoff of white cells to indicate a UTI than you might. And what if the presenter wasn't even referring to evidence of a UTI, but rather to evidence of ATN or glomerular disease? So when it comes to stating most test results, either state normal or specifically describe the abnormality and allow the listener the opportunity to reach his or her own conclusions. So that concludes the reporting section. It's usually responsible for the majority of the duration of the HMP, though as mentioned, almost solely conveys nothing but objective facts which have been screened and selectively emphasized by the presenter based on their relevance to the patient's chief complaint and past history. The reporting section is then followed by the linking statement. That term is almost certainly new to you. Instead, most people will refer to the general concept of the section as the impression or summary statement, or in the literature, it's called the problem representation, though these terms are not necessarily used as specifically 
as I encourage you to do. For me, the linking statement consists of one to two sentences which link the reporting section to the interpretation section. It also links the most important key features of the history exam and tests into higher order structures that allow one to begin to formulate a differential diagnosis. It should usually include some degree of interpretation, but should only explicitly mention a specific diagnosis if the preceding data overwhelmingly support it over alternative diagnoses. Let me break down the structure of a good linking statement as I did for the chief complaint near the beginning of this video. Start with the age and gender, plus the highly relevant past medical history, then add the summary of primary symptoms using distinguishing adjectives, which are sometimes called semantic qualifiers, and end with a summary of objective findings with interpretation and grouping into clinical syndromes when relevant. So that might sound a little abstract, so let me provide a specific example of a linking statement um, so you can understand it better. Mr. Smith is a 62-year-old man with diabetes and alcohol dependence who presents with acute, constant epigastric pain associated with nausea and vomiting, found to have SIRS, severe epigastric tenderness, and a lipase of 800. For those not familiar with the acronym SIRS, it stands for the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. In the U.S., sometimes during rounds or in a daily teaching conference called Morning Report, as an intern or resident, you may be asked to briefly summarize a case, or during attending rounds at the bedside, a senior physician may ask you for something called the one-liner. If the response to this request is a statement similar to this one, I guarantee others around you will be impressed. The structure of the linking statement may seem superficially similar to the structure of the chief complaint, so let me show you a side-by-side -side example of what both might look like for the same patient. Remember that the chief complaint is age and gender, followed by past history, followed by the primary symptom or symptoms, and ending with a duration. So you might have Ms. Gonzalez is a 55-year-old woman with a history of metastatic breast cancer, presenting with dyspnea and chest pain for two hours. A possible linking statement that might follow a complete reporting of the data of Mrs. Gonzalez's presentation could read, Ms. Gonzalez is a 55-year-old woman with a history of metastatic breast cancer, presenting with acute, constant, non-positional dyspnea associated with pleuritic chest pain, found on exam to have hypoxia, a normal chest x-ray, and evidence of right heart strain on exam and EKG. What's the difference? The chief complaint sets the stage. It provides context for the HPI. It allows the listener to appropriately categorize and catalog in his or her mind all of the subsequent information provided in the history. While the linking statement provides the summary and higher order structure necessary to aid the listener in following along as you explain your differential diagnosis. I mentioned earlier that you didn't want to state the diagnosis in the chief complaint because you don't want to bias the listener by failing to allow them to reach his or her own conclusions about a case and validate your own clinical reasoning skills. Certainly, the linking statement here st seems to strongly suggest a specific diagnosis, in this case, pulmonary embolism. But by now, all of the data is already out there, and hopefully the listener has arrived at the same point as you without any bias. And now it's time for the interpretation section, where you will make your case about the differential diagnosis, just in case you as the presenter and your listener aren't on the same page yet. Or alternatively, in case the listener just wants to check that you understand what you're talking about. So no one actually refers to the interpretation section as such, and instead it's always called the assessment and plan. This should be organized as a prioritized problem list and not as a list of organ systems, unless you're in the ICU where this is common. Problem number one on the list should almost always be the symptom or problem summarized in the linking statement. Each problem that is new or directly related to the HPI should have a differential diagnosis, which should include, first, a discussion and or list of key features, which argue for or against each item on the differential diagnosis, and a second, a commitment to one diagnosis as the most likely, referred to as the provisional diagnosis, unless no single diagnosis stands out. Each problem should have a plan that is divided into a diagnostic plan, 
which is a list of additional tests and or consults to be acquired that will help secure the diagnosis, a therapeutic plan, which is a list of meds, IV fluids, special diets, procedures, and or surgeries that will help treat the patient, and finally, an educational plan, if relevant, which is a list of specific topics the patient would need to be educated about prior to discharge. To understand what the assessment and plan should look like, let me show you an example starting with a linking statement. This would be the written form of the assessment and plan. Due to its length, I won't read it in its entirety, but feel free to pause it if you'd like to read through it more completely. In fact, when giving an oral presentation, depending on the patient's complexity, available time, and your audience, what you say aloud may be significantly shorter than what you see here on the screen. So let's take the following linking statement, which in the US would commonly be referred to as the impression. In summary, Mr. Haddad is a 52-year-old man with diabetes presenting with acute, constant, non-positional dyspnea associated with hemoptysis, found to have severe sepsis and hypoxic respiratory failure with bilateral infiltrates on chest x-ray and complicated by acute kidney injury. So next is the problem list. In this case, I'm going to make problem number one, his sepsis with hypoxia and hemoptysis. One could opt to make the sepsis, hypoxia, and hemoptysis all separate individual problems, but since their underlying pathophysiology is likely tightly linked, and since their treatments are strongly overlapping, it seems more logical to keep all three grouped together like this. What follows then is an explanation of the differential diagnosis, including commitment to one specific diagnosis as the most likely, in this case, severe community-acquired pneumonia. Then there is the plan for this problem. The plan has diagnostic and therapeutic sections. The individual items in the plan are written out as a list or in bolded format with as much specifics as possible. The next problem to discuss in order of importance might be his acute kidney injury. Since this is also a new problem, it also deserves a differential diagnosis of some degree but as it is a lesser problem than the sepsis, discussion of the differential is necessarily shorter. Then the diabetes. Since this is a long-standing problem, there is no need for a differential, but it might include a mention of any possible acute complications. Next up is the smoking, which contains the first example of an educational plan, in this case an intention to discuss the importance of cessation once the patient is feeling better. Then rounding out the problem list is the patient nutrition plan, any type of in-hospital prophylaxis such as that against DVTs or nosocomial infections, and lastly, a statement as to the patient's goals of care during the hospitalization, which should always mention the code status and how that determination was reached. This has been quite the exhaustive video, and I hope you feel that your patience has been rewarded. Before switching to the much shorter part two of this video series, which will consist of an annotated example presentation start to finish, let me provide you with some final tips. Stick to the standardized format unless your supervising attending physician specifically instructs you otherwise. Every symptom, abnormal finding, and established diagnosis should be represented in some way within the problem list. Every test ordered and medication prescribed should be mentioned in the written plan. When presenting the HMP, consider your audience. When in doubt as to what level of detail they want, ask. Aim to keep your complete oral presentation to within five to seven minutes. Avoid reading off your written HMP when giving the oral presentation. Don't editorialize. And finally, be sure to practice as much as possible. Presenting an HMP on a medically complex patient is a difficult skill and you will not master it in a day, or a week, or even a month. But with deliberate practice, and frequent feedback from both peers and those more experienced, hopefully this will feel natural and effortless by the end of your training.